Today is the International Day of Prayer for the Peace of Jerusalem. It's also one year since the horrific events of October 7th that happened in Israel uh, from the Nova Festival and the attack that took place. And I think it's really important that we stop and we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I think it's really important. Uh, the Bible tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Psalm 122, David, 3,000 years ago, King David wrote these words, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. Isn't that a great promise? It really is. Listen, I wanted to give you some context. God formed a people called Israel. He called them Israel. They came from Jacob, who he renamed Israel. And they actually, if you back up all the way back to Abraham, he formed a people and he called them Israel. And then out of that people, he formed a nation. And he placed them where they are today, thousands of years ago, right in the middle of nation after nation after nation of enemies of God's people. Why would God place his people in the middle of all of his enemies. Now we might think, so he, they could blow them off the face of the earth, but that wasn't the answer. God put his people in the middle of all of his enemies and he made Jerusalem their capital and he, built, he had them build a temple to his name where people would recognize God's presence was so that anybody in the world who wanted to worship God could find their way to Jerusalem. Anybody in the known world, all those enemies surrounding God's people, if any of them decided, I want to worship the one true God, they would find themselves going, getting to the temple. And so David writes these words in the context of a psalm that talks about worship. Hey, we want to worship God at the temple. And that's where the temple is in Jerusalem. So pray for the safety of Jerusalem and the peace of Jerusalem so that people all over the world can worship God. How many of you want people all over the world worshiping God, right? We really do. Now, 3,000 years later, the Jews, the Bible says that the Jewish people in Israel still figures prominently in God's plans for people to worship him as we get closer and closer to the end times. And church, just in case you didn't know, we are closer and closer to the end times right now. The, the Jewish people figure prominently. Listen, we didn't replace the Jews as Christians. We got grafted into a family. And so now we get to pray for the Jewish people and pray for the nation of Israel. And I want you to understand, church, when we do that, we're not saying that we support every single thing that the Israeli government does. That's not the call here, okay? Just like we're called to pray for the church. How many of you would say we're called to pray for the church in the world? Amen? Amen. It doesn't mean that we support everything that every church does that might be not okay. But we're praying for God's grace to pour out through the church and we're recognizing that the Jewish people have been unreasonably and spiritually demonized for 4,000 years because the devil doesn't want Jews to exist. Because the devil doesn't want Israel to exist. And the world and our culture has bought a fair, faulty narrative about the history, not only the ancient history of Israel and the Jews, but the modern history of Israel and the Jews. I don't have time to get into the whole hi history, like that would be a master's level class for us to sit and talk about Middle East history. But we need to know as Christians that the enemy of our souls also wants to take out Jews. The spirit of anti-Semitism is demonic. I wanna say that again, because I want you to hear it. Again, I'm not saying we support everything that the government of Israel would ever do, but the spirit of anti-Semitism is demonic. For there to be protests, and I'm gonna get real with you a second here, okay? For there to be protests this weekend against the Jewish people when we're commemorating and looking at something that was a horrific demonic attack against people on, on, on October 7th. If there's anything in our heart that says, yeah, well, that was a bad attack, but but they deserve this, but this happened, but that happened. We're missing the point that the enemy wants to annihilate the Jewish people. God says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And I believe that when he says that, he's also calling us to pray for everybody's peace in that region. Because when Jerusalem's at peace and when Israel's at peace, I wanna tell you that peace can extend to those nations around. And we care about people's lives, whether they're Jewish or Muslim. We care about people's lives, whether they're Israelis or Palestinians. We care about people's lives. But the Bible says the way we start spiritually to care about people's lives is by praying for the peace 
of Jerusalem. So as, if you're a Christian here this morning, can I encourage you to do three things as we leave this place today? And I'm going to get to the rest of my sermon in a minute, but we're going to pray first. But the first thing I want to ask you to do is do your homework. Tell somebody next to you, you have homework to do. Because so often we don't know about the issues politically, spiritually, biblically, historically, and we just take whatever narrative is being fed to us. Can I encourage you as a Christian to seek the truth? about what really has happened there over thousands and thousands and hundreds and scores of years. Do your homework. Number two, just like the Bible says, pray for peace. Say that with me. Pray for peace. Peace means wholeness. And it's interesting that 3,000 years ago, the Holy Spirit inspired David to write these words that we would pray for the peace of Jerusalem. God knowing that even today, what happens in that region impacts the rest of the world. You, you don't need to be super smart politically to understand that the war that's breaking out there has the potential of breaking out all over the world. So we want to say, Lord, we want to see not, not see World War III happen. Then we need to pray for resolution and peace in that area. And a real peace, not a fake peace, a true peace that takes people into consideration that takes the nation of Israel into consideration, that takes Jewish people into consideration, that also takes other human beings into consideration. We need to pray for wholeness and peace. And then finally is this. Um, let's invite the Prince of Peace. Because anytime there's true peace anywhere, the Prince of Peace is in the middle of it. Jesus was the Prince of Peace, and we're going to pray for the people in that region that they would find Jesus. We're going to pray for the Jewish people that they would find their Messiah and Jesus Christ. And that that area would be a place where Jesus is glorified. Can we pray, you guys? So, Lord, we come before you now and we join with David from 3,000 years ago and we join with the church all over the world today praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Lord, we recognize, according to Zechariah 14, that the Messiah is going to come back a second time to Jerusalem. That according to Acts chapter 1, that the same way and the same place you left, you're going to come back. You're coming back, Jesus, and when you come back, you're coming to Jerusalem. There's something important about that city in terms of the end times, in terms of what you're doing in the world today. And so we ask that your peace that passes any kind of understanding would ascend to that place. Lord, we pray for your supernatural understanding among the leaders that are waging war now on all sides. Lord, the world looks at that situation and says it's hopeless, and it may be hopeless politically, but it's not hopeless in you. So I pray that whatever your solution is to the future there, Lord, I pray that people would see it, even people that don't know you, that they would somehow discern it and see it. Lord, we pray for a supernatural peace and we pray that you as the Prince of Peace would rule and reign over that region. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? 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 Okay, amen. Thanks, Mario. I love you, man. You're good. You're a good man. good man. I came in early this morning. I, I come in early on Sundays to pray. And I think I told you this before, but that's not a brag. I, I'm such not a morning person that if I don't wake up four hours before you guys get here, I'm not going to be awake for you. So I have to be here early enough to get my body going. But I came in to pray. Usually I'm the first one here alone. But Mario was here early and he was just tuning, kind of tuning up the piano and not literally because it's electric, but uh, he was, he was getting it ready and he was, I was praying through the room and Afterwards, I came to him and said, dude, can you show up at six o'clock every Sunday and just play and I'll pray? That would be great. He said, no. <laughs> he said, no such thing, actually. Um, the things that we just approached in praying for Israel point out something. And I, I want us to, we're going to camp out somewhere today that I believe is going to be helpful for us. Uh, every week's helpful for us, but there's something really unique and specific that I feel for today, and that is that if you're a Christian, if you know Jesus, you need to know that there can be things that Christians disagree on, that Christians have big disagreements on. Did any of you know that Christians sometimes disagree on some things? Yeah, okay. You're, you're, you're keyed into that. Maybe you're a new Christian and you thought, I thought we were supposed to agree on everything. Well, we never insist that a church operates in lockstep unity. I'm sorry, in lockstep uniformity. Uniformity means you have to think the same on everything. You have to make all the same decisions on everything, that you're always right together. And that's, and that's what a cult would, would, would inspire. Listen, we don't, we don't ask the church to be in lockstep uniformity on everything, but we insist on functioning in unity. Everybody say the word unity with me. Unity. 
unity. Because there are always true brothers and sisters who will come to different conclusions about all kinds of things. Do any of you have somebody in your life that's a brother or sister in Christ that doesn't agree with you about something? Yeah? Okay. Some of you nodded your head. Some of you raised your hands really quick. Some of you pointed at the person next to you. (laughs) I didn't ask you to do that, okay? We disagree about things, all kinds of things. In fact, the fact that we disagree about all kinds of things inspired this 17th century theologian. His name is Rupertus Meldinius. And if you're looking for a name for your kid, that's a great one right there. (laughs) Rupertus Meldinius said these words famously, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. Or in other words, that's an old-fashioned word for love. He said this after there was a big division and a schism and a conflict over some point of theology. He wrote these words because there are some things that are essential to Christians. If you call yourself a Christian, there are some things that you have to believe. There are not many, many, many things, but there are some limited things that you must believe. Things like Jesus is God. Jesus is part of a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God, three persons, and Jesus is came to be born of a virgin so that he could be fully man and fully God, growing up without sin, and then dying for our sins on the cross, buried physically as dead, and then rising again physically from the grave three days later. We all believe that as Christians. If you know Jesus, if you love him, if you're a Christian, those are things that are essential that we believe. We believe that when he rose from the grave, he offered eternal life freely, not something we could work for. But to those of us who would turn to him and surrender to him, that he offered us free, eternal life. And that is an essential part of Christianity. Whether you're Reformed or non-Reformed, whether you're Baptist or Pentecostal, whether you're Catholic or Protestant, these are things that you believe. They're essentials and they're primary. But Christians disagree on many non-essentials. Amen? all kinds of secondary issues that are not salvation level issues. Things like eschatology, which is a really long, fancy word for the things that have to do with the end times. Some people believe that there's a rapture and Jesus is coming back before there's a great tribulation and he's going to rapture us all to heaven. Some people believe that Jesus is going to rapture us all to heaven in the middle of the tribulation. And some people believe that Jesus is going to rapture us all after the tribulation happens. I had a Bible college professor that would talk about the end times and he talked about the tree pre-tribulation rapture and the mid-tribulation rapture and the post-tribulation rapture. And we asked him, which do you believe? He says, I don't believe in any of them. I believe in pan-tribulation rapture. And we said, what's that? He said, it's all gonna pan out in the end. (laughs) That's a good one. I think I'm gonna believe in that one. But we can disagree on how the end times are gonna happen. We can disagree on baptism. By the way, these are important things. I'm not saying they're unimportant. They're very important. But we can disagree on them and still be Christians. We believe that people are baptized when they make a confession of faith and that they come to the waters and they identify with the death of Jesus in the water when they go under water and they come out of the water identifying with his resurrection as adults who make decisions. But there are churches that are Jesus-loving, Bible-believing churches that believe baptism happens different ways. By sprinkling, happens when people are infants, these are not salvation level issues. We, we, we have Christians that disagree on how the world was created. Some people believe that God created the earth in six literal 24 hour days and then he took a break called the Sabbath. Uh, some people believe that God created the world in six ages over a long, long period of time. But if you're a Christian, you believe that God created the world You just may not be in agreement on how he created the world. Like I said, though, these aren't unimportant issues. They're very important issues. Saturday or Sunday, I have some friends that believe we should be gathering together on Saturday because that's the original Sabbath. And we decide, uh, and many churches, most churches decide they're gathering on Sunday, the Lord's Day. The role of spiritual gifts today. Ecclesiology, which means how the church is supposed to be run. Politics. Christians disagree on politics. Can you believe that? And some Christians even disagree on whether the Dodgers are the best baseball team. And 
I, I know, I might, I might really mess you guys up, but I'm just saying, there are people that really believe in Jesus, and they love the Padres. I don't know how, but they do. They, just, they really believe in Jesus. I'm not sure how that happens. Um, these are all secondary issues. And those issues require that spiritually we give each other grace. By the way, these people are, like the last three weeks, they've been wearing Dodgers gear right up front here. So I'm like, they're my heroes. They're like, they're holding in here. Um, secondary issues require that we give each other grace and space and liberty. Scriptures abound in calling us to unity even when we disagree. Let me just read a few of them to you. Just a few. I can't read them all because we'd be here all day. Psalm 133 says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. For there, in unity, that's where the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Do anybody in here want to be blessed? I want to be blessed. One of the places where we're blessed is when we are able to walk together with brothers and sisters in unity. Again, not uniformity. There can be things, important things that you disagree on, but under the cross, we're unified. Colossians 3 says, therefore, as God's chosen people, oh, I love that I'm chosen by the Lord, holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against somebody. Forgive as the Lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on love which binds them together in perfect, say it with me, unity. Anybody happy that the Lord forgave you? I don't know about you, but the Lord forgave me a lot and keeps forgiving me. And it's, this says, I have to forgive other people the same way Jesus forgave me. That's amazing. Ephesians 4, 2 says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort. Say those two words with me. Every effort. Not just make an effort. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And finally, Jesus himself, he's praying for his disciples the night before he goes to the cross. This is a very important prayer. And he's praying for his disciples, but he doesn't stop there. He continues to pray. And he says, my prayer isn't for these disciples alone. I pray also for all of those who will believe in me through their message. You know who that is? That's you and me. Jesus is praying for believers 2,000 years later who would believe the message. And this is what he prays. If Jesus prays one thing out loud in scripture for you and me, here's what he prays. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Does anybody want your world to know that God sent Jesus and loves them so much? I want people to know that Jesus loves them. And Jesus said, the world's gonna know that God loves them and sent me if you walk in unity. See, church, there are so many things we can disagree strongly on. Let me say it a different way. There are so many important things. Please hear me. There are so many important things. I'm not saying they're unimportant. I will fight tooth and nail for some of my beliefs on this, and yet I will not fight against my brother or sister because sacrificial unity is essential to our faith. And now I'm going to take a little left turn in the sermon and do something a little bit different and a little bit uh, maybe strange, something I've never done in a sermon before. Is that okay? Is that okay? Yes. Yeah, I'm glad you said yes because I was going to do it anyway. <laughs> um, but I'm going to work this out in front of you. I just want to work this out in front of you because there's so many things we can disagree on. And you might be thinking of something right now that you disagree with somebody on and you think, Pastor Tim, I don't know, how, how can I hold strongly to my opinion or to my philosophy or to my ideology or to my theology or my doctrine and still love and be in unity with somebody that disagrees with me? So let me get specific in ways that I usually don't. And I'm, I'm not trying to expose any person. I'm actually exposing my heart to you and showing you just how I deal with stuff when things are very important, but I disagree with a brother or a sister, or they disagree with me. 
in walking distance, like literally if you started walking now, you could be there uh, under an hour, probably a half an hour, is a church called Grace Community Church. It's just down the road. It's um, on Roscoe um, toward the 170. Grace Community Church has been around a long time. And in fact, the pastor there has been pastoring there since 1969. 1969 is when Pastor Jack Hayford came to this church. And John MacArthur, Pastor John MacArthur, came to Grace Community Church uh, right there in Sun Valley, a couple miles away from us. And both churches had a really amazing and miraculous trajectory. Both churches became global, globally influencing churches, and both of those pastors became globally influencing pastors. In fact, I'm going to use the word tribe this morning, which just indicates that the kind of people that believe like you do, d- d- not even depending on denomination, maybe a better term for it is stream. But in both streams that Jack Hayford had influence and John MacArthur had influence, both of them had influence beyond their tribe or beyond their stream. Uh, People like me who have learned theology learned theology and Bible from both of these men. And in essentials, the Church on the Way is our brothers and sisters with with Grace Community Church. We, We believe in Jesus. We want to follow him. We believe in the word of God. We believe we need redemption through his blood. And we believe that we need to be regenerated by the Holy Spirit. We believe all of those things together. But there are points of biblical understanding where we disagree sharply. Like sharply. Significantly. And I want to just work a couple of those out in front of you. And there's a reason for this, two reasons. One is there's a couple of things I want us to understand as a church. Some of you are new Christians. Some of you are new to the church. And I want you to understand why we believe what we believe. But more than that and more important than that is I want you to understand how I can walk in unity with a brother who absolutely 100% disagrees doctrinally with me. But Jesus calls us to walk in unity. Because each of you are gonna have issues where somebody who's a brother or sister in Christ so vehemently disagrees with you and may even call you an enemy. But we need to learn how to walk in grace and forgiveness and freedom and love. Amen? Amen. So first first one is this. Here's an issue where we disagree sharply. Women as pastoral leaders. Women as pastoral leaders. And and he's been saying this for decades, but in 2019, I just pulled this quote from the internet. Um, MacArthur said this, women who pastor and women who preach in the church are a disgrace and openly reflect opposition to the clear command of the word of God. Now, the first time I ever read that, uh, I had Deborah scheduled to preach. (laughs) So I had to kind of rethink it. I'm like, honey, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. No, I didn't rethink it. In fact, we just had Deborah preach last week as well, and you did a great job. You did a great job, really good. I was in D.C. watching, cheering her on. I was like, yeah, this is so, so good. Uh, And it really was good. And we are a church that believes in women and not just preaching, but in leadership. In fact, the senior leadership team, the senior pastoral team of this church, I'm not just the only senior pastor. There's four of us, and we lead the church together, kind of a lead elder, lead pastor team. It's me and and Deborah and Doug and Krista, Pastor Doug and Pastor Krista, Pastor Tim and Pastor Deborah. We lead this church together. We're, We're equal. We lead as a partnership. But for somebody who doesn't believe that women should lead and somebody who doesn't believe that women should teach, that's a clear opposition to what he sees as a command in the word of God. And there's four New Testament texts that are used, four. Four New Testament texts that they would point to, people like MacArthur would point to and say, hey, this is why women shouldn't preach, it's why women shouldn't lead. And I can't get into all of them now, but if you're taking notes, you can write them down and you can look at them later because they all look, if you just look at them on the surface, you go, hey, they looks like they have a point. 1 Corinthians 11, 3 through 12, 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35, 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 15, and Titus chapter one. But there's a biblical problem with all four of these things and the reasoning that they attach to these scriptures and it's a biblical issue that I take with them, not just cultural or personal. Because I want to tell you something that the church on the way believes, and Pastor Tim Clark believes, and I lead us to believe, we all believe, and this church has believed for a long time, that if it's not supported in the Bible, then we shouldn't believe it. Like, we believe in the Bible. I hear like four people saying amen. Anybody want to? We believe in the Bible. And if there's stuff in the Bible, if there's stuff, thank you, if there's there's stuff in the Bible that gets under my skin, and I don't like it personally or I don't like it culturally, I'm not allowed to change what I believe based on what I think. I have to go, what does the Bible say about it? And they go with that. 
And the problem is we're accused sometimes of putting women in leadership or women as pastors or women as speakers because it's just what we feel and it's easier culturally and we're capitulating to feminism or something like that. And the reality is, no, it's biblical. And the immediate text, the context for each of these four texts actually is talking about a very specific issue that's either happening in the local church that Paul is writing to in each case or some kind of family dysfunctioning that he's referencing. There's a specific issue in the immediate context of these four verses, but if you look at the whole Bible context, because you have to do that, by the way, when you're reading the Bible, you have to read a verse in context. Don't just pull a verse out and go, well, this is what the Lord's speaking to me today. You know, the old story about the guy who needed to hear a word from the Lord, and so he opened up the Bible and said, Lord, lead me to the right verse, and he opened it up and closed his eyes and pointed to it, and it said, Judas hung himself. <laughs> he said, oh, I don't know what was going on there. I really need to be careful about that. I love, one more time, Lord, just speak to me, speak to me. Lord, speak to me. And he opened the Bible again and pointed to a verse, and it said, go and do likewise. <laughs> we don't just look at a verse out of context. You have to look at the verse that comes before it, the verse that comes after it, the chapter that comes before it, the chapter that comes after it. And to be honest, when you're reading the Bible, you can read the Bible without understanding all the context. The Lord will speak to you. But don't ever think, yeah, I, got, I know exactly what this says until you really understand the Bible because we don't read any one verse in the Bible out of context with the whole Bible. We read it in the whole Bible. And if you look at the whole biblical context of women leader, you remember, you remember, you realize that women led, they proclaimed the gospel, they prophesied, they ministered in the church, they ministered to the church. Women were all over the Bible leading and preaching. In fact, it says the very first witness to Jesus' resurrection, the first evangelist, the first sermon was done by who? Mary Magdalene. She saw Jesus at the tomb, John chapter 20. She runs to the disciples and she tells them all about what Jesus told her to tell them that he was alive. If that's not a sermon, I don't know what is. And then in Acts chapter two, Peter gets a download from the Holy Spirit. He's speaking to thousands of people and here's what he says at the birth of the church. This is what this church is gonna be like. That the Holy Spirit's gonna come on all flesh. Everybody say all with me. All, all flesh. He says your sons and your daughters will prophesy. You're going to both prophesy. And then if you, if you, if you fast forward in, the chapter, uh, in Acts, the chapter 18, you see Priscilla and Aquila. Actually, it's flipped. It's unusual for the culture and the context, but Paul usually calls them Priscilla and Aquila. He uses the woman's name first. And in chapter 18 of Acts, they get a hold of Apollos, who is a powerful apostle that doesn't fully understand the life of the Spirit. And both husband and wife sit down and teach them a more in a more accurate way. Priscilla is a teacher. And those are just three examples, and I can go on and on and on and on. But I want to briefly look at one of the verses, just for the next few minutes, that is used to tell us to, to try to say, hey, women shouldn't be preaching, women shouldn't be leading, and just unpack it in context so you understand why the disagreement exists. In 1 Corinthians 14, 34, it says this, women should remain silent in the churches. Wow. Wow. Well, I get there you go. All right. Maybe we should take off Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever and put that verse up there. Women. <laughs> First service didn't laugh at all at that. And I thought, oh man, I, I took a chance in thinking that maybe you had a better sense of humor. Okay. Uh, Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission. As the law says, if they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Now, I want to just say right away, when you read that verse in, out of context, just, just pull it out and read that verse, it really looks like what the people who are saying, women shouldn't speak in the church. It looks like maybe they've got a point. Maybe that's what the Bible says. And we start wrestling with this and go, man, is, is my church not biblical? Is the way that we think not biblical? But I wanna, I wanna help us understand, and, and by the way, in every one of these four texts that I gave you, we can do the same thing. But we don't have time to do it in all four, so we're gonna do it for this one. I want you to understand how we look at the Bible and how in looking at the Bible the way we do, it's biblically sound. Sometimes we, we would be accused of going with our feelings, of going with culture, but I'm telling you, this is biblically sound because if you look at the way this, ver this, this, this uh, 
uh, air, this section of scripture starts. It's in verse 26. It says this. What shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you has a hymn, a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. So the key here, and you're going to see it in a minute, is everything must be done so the church may be built up. But when he starts this, this, um, this passage, this text, this section, To the Corinthians, he had just been talking to both men and women all the way through the book. And then he says, hey, now I want to tell you, when you come together to worship, when you come together to gather in the name of the Lord, each of you will bring a tongue interpretation, a hymn, a word of knowledge, this and that. You're going to bring together something valuable for the church. If he's talking to men and women all the way through Corinthians, when he gets to this part and he says, when you come together, each of you has something to bring. Do you think he's just talking to men? He's talking to men and women. So he's saying, men and women, when you come together, you're all going to have something valuable to contribute in this context. And then two verses later in verse 28, he says this, that when tongues are happening, the the public uh, expression of speaking in a spiritual language publicly in front We would say in our culture, they didn't have them then with a microphone so that everybody could hear you. He's not talking about private prayer language, but he says in publicly, when somebody has a message in tongues, only two or three should bring a message. So it's not just a bunch of people speaking in tongues and interpretation, the whole gathering. But what he says is that when that happens, that people should speak one at a time and somebody must interpret. And if there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. And so here he goes. It says, when you come together, everybody has something to contribute. If it happens to be a tongue and there's no interpreter, then you need to be quiet. Keep silent in the church, verse 28. And then in verse 30, it talks about prophetic revelation, and it's similar. And it says if somebody's up prophesying, and in this context, it could mean giving a prophetic sermon, or maybe it's prophesying. We're not 100% sure, but they're using the prophetic gift. It says if there's another person that needs to prophesy, they need to wait and, here's that, that phrase again, keep silent. They need to keep silent until the first one is done. So instead of all the confusion that happens when people are like fighting, right? It's not like, you know, I'm up here preaching and prophesying and Pastor Doug's like, wait, I've got a word. And then all of a sudden you've got like um, Pastor Cage match happening up here. Like, okay, who's going to win, right? Wait, no, no, go, go. I don't want to fight you (laughs) because I'd lose. (laughs) Um, But so instead it's saying, no, keep everything in order. Keep it in order. Okay, so now the very next verse, two more verses later, in verse 33, this is the key to the whole passage. Because God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. So the whole passage is about that, right? Now we get to the part about women in verse 34. So God's not a God of disorder, but of peace. Everything should be done for building up the church. Oh, when you come together, men and women, you all have something to contribute to the body life. Oh, and if somebody's speaking in tongues then, uh, and doesn't have an interpreter, you should stay silent in the church because it's not going to make any sense to anybody if there's not an interpretation. Oh, and if there's a prophet speaking, then they should wait. The person that wants to prophesy should keep silent and wait until the first one is done so that it's not confusing. Because God's not a God of disorder, but of peace. And on the heels of that, then he says this. Literally, if you read it, women, don't interrupt a gathering to ask your husbands to explain stuff in church. Wait until you get home. That's what he's saying. Because you have to understand the context of the early Christians very likely would have borrowed their their, their structure, their worship time structure from the Jews. And in the Jewish synagogues, the men and the women would be separate. And so you might come up with a question that's being asked, an inquiry that one of the wives has and sitting across the room It'd be like if Doug stayed there and we had, we were separate men and women. Wouldn't that be fun? Um, And Krista, Pastor Krista was over here. And I just said what I said and Pastor Krista stands up because he's all across the room and says, Doug, what did Tim mean by that? (laughs) And Paul says, God's not a God of disorder. He's a God of peace. By the way, by the way, If you take the Bible seriously, which we do, if you take the Bible literally, I think you have to read this and ask these questions. If it says 
that a woman shouldn't, well, the, the verse says women should remain silent in the church, is not allowed to speak, must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it's disgraceful for a woman to speak in church. If they want to inquire about something, they have to ask their husbands at home. What if they're not married? If you're taking this literally, then all of a sudden you're saying, well, only married women that have husbands at home aren't allowed to speak. The single women are allowed to speak. And all the single ladies said, yeah. All right. <laughs> I can, I can get up. Okay. Um, what if they don't have a husband? Okay, what if it's not a question? It says if they have a question, if they have an inquiry, then they, they need to wait until they get home. What if instead it's a prophecy or a prayer or a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge? It doesn't preclude that. Oh, and by the way, this isn't actually precluding women speaking in church at all like some say it does because if you look at it in a biblical context then you back up a few chapters. In 1 Corinthians 11, 5, it says, every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It's the same as shaving, having her head shaved. Every woman who prays or prophesies in church, because the context of 1 Corinthians 11 is that they're gathering together. Every woman who prays or prophesies in church without her head covered that's not okay in Corinth. So it means that they're standing up to pray and prophesy, and that's okay. By the way, the reason it's not okay in Corinth is because Corinth is a very sexually immoral city. And I won't go into all of why it was. There's a whole historical reality there. But if you're a woman in Corinth and you shave your head or your head's uncovered, it would be the same as saying, hey, I'm available. Or even worse yet, in some cases, I'm a prostitute. And Paul's saying, listen, Let's not give off the impression that you're sexually available, so keep your head covered. By the way, where did I read that about Corinth? I read it in the MacArthur Study Bible. So John MacArthur himself recognizes that in Corinth, the uncovering of the head was appointing to sexual promiscuity, and he admits that it's a cultural reality that's limited to Corinth, and so therefore, if you go to Grace Community Church today, you don't have to cover your head if you're a woman. Amen, right? You don't have to wear a hat. They're not going to make you put a shawl on because that was a cultural reality. And there are other things in the Bible where you can believe the Bible and take it seriously at its word and still understand the cultural, historical, linguistic context. And that doesn't mean that you're not believing the Bible is the absolute, inspired, authoritative, perfect word of God. Amen? Okay, so there's that, right? And I know that was a lot to get there. But there's that. Another example, and I'll be quicker about this one, is the supernatural sign gifts of the Holy Spirit. So Grace Community Church and the tribe that they belong to, um, actually this weekend is the cessationist conference. And the cessationist conference is, means that a bunch of pastors get together that don't believe the Holy Spirit supernaturally works today through the sign gifts of the Holy Spirit, through healing, through tongues and interpretation, through prophecy. They say that all ended in the first century. And there's a conference every year where they get together and they talk about it and they slam people that believe that it still happens today. And there's even a movie that came out at the end of last year called The Cessationist Movie. And some of you may have seen the movie and some of you might see references to this conference. And again, I'm not beating anybody up. I'm just explaining the reality that people believe this. And I want to tell you as the pastor of this church, I can't see it biblically anywhere. It takes tons of theolog theological gymnastics to prove that the Holy Spirit stopped working in the first century. The Bible is full of, of, of stories and instruction about the Holy Spirit over and over and over and over again. You see things about the Spirit. And sometimes people that are cessationists will say things like, well, we just see all of the abuses happening. We see the abuses happening in the charismatic church and we just want to shut that down. But in 1 Corinthians 12, 1, Paul's writing to a church that is radically abusing the Holy Spirit's gifts and the supernatural manifestations. And if I were Paul, I would have been tempted to say, hey, Corinthians, stop using the gifts of the Holy Spirit because you don't know how to do it. Put them away because you don't know how to handle them, right? I would be tempted to do that, right? My kid's playing with something they shouldn't be playing with. They don't know how to do it. It's like, you don't get to play with that anymore. And I'd be tempted to say, you can't work in the power of the Spirit anymore. And that's what's happening today in our culture is there are people all over there saying, there's abuses of the power of the Spirit, and so we need to shut this down. Well, Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, 1, instead of saying shut it down, he says this, about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be ignorant. So instead of making a movie about the abuses of the Holy Spirit, he says, we're going to teach you how to handle this properly. 
So because biblically you just can't see it. There's four texts that wrestle with women pastors. I told you about those. But there's nothing like this in the Bible regarding the sign gifts of the Spirit. The texts that get used about this are a stretch. In fact, somebody from that stream, somebody from that tribe in a website that I read, because I still learn a lot from these guys, this website's called the the Gospel Coalition, wrote these words after a long defense of cessationism, saying the gifts don't work anymore today. He ended with this, but there is no definitive Bible teaching that they've ceased. There's no definitive Bible teaching that the gifts have ceased. In fact, this is the one verse that gets used a lot. It's a verse that many of you know because it's part of the love chapter, right? Some of you have the love chapter at your weddings. Some of you have the love chapter crocheted on a pillow at home. You, the love chapter, we all know it. Love is patient, love is kind, et cetera, et cetera. But this is where it ends. That chapter says love never fails. Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there's knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what's in part disappeared? For we only see in a reflection now as in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And there are those that would say the Bible is what it's talking about when it says when the perfect comes, then the imperfect will disappear. And I do believe that the Bible is a perfect representation of the word of God, but it also says that now I see in a reflection dimly, then I shall see fully and know everything and be fully known. Can I tell you something? Even though the Bible's perfect, I still don't fully know. I don't see everything perfectly. I still see a reflection dimly in a mirror. Uh, Listen, I'm not, I know right right about now you're thinking, what are you going on about, Pastor Tim? (laughs) See, those, those who believe like we do often get accused of elevating the sign gifts above the Bible. And nothing could be further from the truth for us because everything we do is measured by the word of God. It's why we believe in the Holy Spirit's supernatural empowerment today, by the way. Why do we believe in the Holy Spirit's supernatural empowerment? Is it because we've seen it and we go, well, we gotta write this in the Bible? No, because sometimes I don't see it. If I don't see healing happen, instead of saying, well, the Bible must have quit healing in the first century, If I don't see healing happen in our church and the Bible has healing all over it, then I need to align myself with the word of God and say, Lord, would you bring healing to this church? If I don't see women active in ministry leadership in my church, but I see that it happened in the Bible, then I need to get on my knees and say, Lord, I want to see happen what's happening in the Bible. I don't want to explain away the stuff that's happening in the Bible because I don't experience it. I want to take my lack of experience and say, Lord, I want to experience everything that happened in the Bible because I believe in the word of God. And to be honest, it's painful to have your heart misunderstood and your intellect disrespected and your faith questioned, because I have. My heart's been misunderstood by people that are in this stream. My intellect, oh, he's just not smart enough. He doesn't think the way we do. And even questioning my faith, is that guy really a Christian? I wanna tell you something. Why did I say all this about them? Because you have people in your life that are brothers and sisters in Christ that are questioning your intellect and your faith and your heart. And instead of pushing back and becoming their enemy, we get to walk in unity with them. We get to walk in unity with them. We get to love them. We get to love them. We seek unity with our brothers and our sisters under the cross. I would love to have a respectful Bible-based conversation with any of these people with Pastor John. I'd love to meet him and sit down over lunch and have a conversation, not to try to convince him of what I believe, but just to express my love and my care and concern for him and their church. I wanna tell you something, again, without patting myself on the back, but this is just what I feel called to. I feel called to pray for that church, and I feel called to pray for that man. And there are days when I'll drive, I'll go out of my way to get here to church and drive by their church and stop and pray. I did it this morning, six o'clock this morning. I drove by Grace Community and I pulled over to pray for the blessing of God on that church and for the blessing of God on John MacArthur. I was praying for that church until a security guard came my way and then I left. (laughs) Didn't want to get caught. But here's why. Not only are we unified with our brothers and sisters, but church, I want to see, I want want people to find Jesus in our city. 
And can I tell you that people are finding Jesus there? Can I keep tell you people are being equipped there? Not with every doctrinal understanding that I have, but they're being equipped in the word of God. They're being, they're being encouraged to have a passion for the word of God. After first service, I had a couple of people come up and said, said I got saved at Grace Community. And I, and I learned a passion for the word of God at Grace Community. And then, and then I hit a wall on something and I had to come here. And we're not here to go, hey, all you Grace Community people that have hit a wall, come to the church on the way. Yeah. Or the other way around, because we're not in competition with our brothers and sisters. We're in unity. We're in unity. And we love them. And you'll never hear me call them an enemy. And while we sharply disagree on so many things, we're on the same team. We're on the same team. And here's the point. You and other believers around you may have important distinctions and even really important big disagreements, but those should never lead to destructive divisions. We work to reconcile our hearts and our lives. And maybe it has to do with doctrine or theology, or maybe it has to do with politics, or maybe it has to do with lifestyle, or maybe it has to do with, um, with what somebody just disagreed. You may have some, listen, you may have somebody that you had such a bad business uh, disagreement with that you parted company and you wouldn't even want to see each other in the same grocery store. But can I tell you that Jesus wants more for you than that? That he wants more for you than that? That he calls us to unity even when we did disagree. So Lord, let's just pray right now. Lord, we so love you. And our response is that we want to be people who are reconcilers. In 2 Corinthians 5, you called us to a ministry of reconciliation. Because you say we are ambassadors for Jesus who reconciled us to the Father through the cross. Lord, we were far from you. Not only did we disagree, but we were divided and we were rebellious and we were divisive and we didn't want anything to do with you. And while we were yet sinners, while we were the worst of sinners, that's when you died for us to reconcile us. Lord, we want to love people and forgive people the way you've loved and forgiven us. But first, God, if we don't know you and we need to be reconciled to the Father through your work on the cross and your resurrection, we need to receive eternal life because of what you offer us freely eternal life that goes forever after we die, but it starts right now with the quality of life that you want to give us. Lord, we want to respond to that.